last week we talked about the Arian crisis when 90 percent of the church's hierarchy was on the side of the wrong position okay in the church denying the true divinity of Christ now we jump 200 years to another crisis and this is a real humdinger it's one that a lot of people don't know come on up don't be shy and, and uh, sign in please uh, here's the picture of the old Roman Empire and now we're looking at around 535 AD, to about 200 years after the period of time we we're talking about. The Roman Empire still existed, but this entire western portion was gone. Okay, uh, it was uh, the barbarians had broken through and had taken over and were ruling all of these areas, including Italy. Uh, there were the Ostrogoths that were ruling Italy. The Vandals were ruling North Africa. The Visigoths were ruling uh, Spain. The Franks were ruling uh, Gaul. Uh, the Angles and Saxons had take, taken over most of, not all, but at least over half of, uh, of Britain. And uh, it was uh, other barbarians, uh, Slavs had invaded uh, into Illyria, although they were still holding out. Uh, the people in the West still spoke Latin but they were being ruled by uh, kings, tribal chieftains, barbarian kings who uh, didn't speak their language and didn't have the same religion. I mean, the barbarians were mostly uh, Aryans, you know, so they could kind of run the, the church the way they wanted, whereas the, the indigenous population was not. The indigenous population were uh, various places, different religions, but mostly Catholic Christians. However, in the East, there was very little that had been lost. Uh, all of Greece, all of what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor, all of Egypt and, uh, and Syria were still under the rule of the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, whose new capital was in Constantinople, the former Byzantium, which is why it's later called the Byzantine Empire. And it's a authoritarian uh, Roman Empire type situation. They're still in the capital, they're still speaking Latin there. Although increasingly the indigenous population, the lingua franca, so to speak, to use an anachronism, speaks Greek, you know, Hellenic Greek. And they, um, and more and more, uh, the empire is becoming kind of a, a Greek speaking empire. Although still, uh, the official name of Constantinople is indeed New Rome. It's also built on seven hills. And it's, uh, 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 they're trying to, uh, uh, rest there's still the idea that, gee, you know, all this land was taken from us by barbarians. We don't even have the city of Rome anymore. It's ruled by the Ostrogoths, an Ostrogothic king. Uh, you know, we, uh, we ought to get that back. You know, we ought to restore uh, uh, the, the Roman Empire. Now, during the succeeding 200 years, there was a great deal of controversy. The Arian controversy wasn't the only one. There were others debating about what exactly, who is Jesus Christ? is okay we know he's now true god and true man but how does that work uh is he two persons is he uh does he is he just god is he what's his what's his humanity like and you would get uh, huge arguments uh huge disputes that really, in this age, people took uh, these things extremely seriously. Uh, riots uh, would break out in favor of one side or another. So ecumenical councils were held. And uh, the way that these councils were usually resolved was that they needed the decision, they needed uh, the uh, ratification of the Pope of Rome. Because you know, if the successor of Peter is for it, well, then that must be the, the, the Catholic faith. And so many times okay, the idea that the emperor is wanting to keep a political uh, uh, problem from breaking out would go and uh, try to make some kind of religious compromise, keep everybody happy. They didn't care if it was theologically correct or not. Let's just keep, uh, keep the Eastern Empire from falling apart the way the Western Empire did. And so there was a great deal of... Uh, of trouble and, and, and uh, dissatisfaction uh, that the uh, Byzantine emperors are trying to keep the lid on. And meanwhile, though, they have to contend with Rome. Okay, so uh, the uh, the popes would not 
always go along with, well, not most of the time go along with what the emperors were uh, trying to peddle because uh, it wasn't what was handed down. It wasn't what had been decided already. It wasn't, it was, uh, the defined doctrine had been made clear. Uh, the popes weren't going to reverse that. And so the popes became a kind of a, a, a real problem, you know, for, for the uh, emperors in Constantinople. Uh, in various times, it, you know, we talk about 1054 as being the, the definitive date when the Orthodox churches separated from the, from the Catholic churches. But there have been, been separations between Constantinople and Rome going all the way back to the 400s, okay, over, over these things. And again, uh, but they were still, it wasn't, it wasn't as uniform as it later became. The, the Pope had supporters in the Eastern Roman Emperor, particularly among some of the monks that would say, no, I mean, we have to wait for what the Pope says. Uh, there would always be the people who would be looking, looking to Rome. So the papacy began to be a real problem uh, for uh, people who wanted the church to go into a different direction. So I'm going to show now, uh, and so that's why in this particular episode of our church crises is called trying to buy the keys of Peter. And uh, the, uh, the critical date that we're going to come together with looking at, it's, 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 the subtext is Vigilius. Vigilius is the pope that we're going to consider and the empress. And the, uh, uh, it's 537 AD is a critical year. A lot of, you know, kind of shocking and amazing things happen. Now, what's the solution? Okay, the solution is somebody is eventually going to come to the idea we got to control the Pope. If we can make the Pope ours, then, uh, you know, uh, it'll be a whole different ball game. And I, this is, I'm going to show you a scene from Beckett where the King of England has the same kind of concept with respect to the church in England in, in the, uh, the 11th century, okay? But it, it's, it applies to a different situation, but the principle is the same thing, and it's the principle that's going to apply here. So let's take a look. An extraordinary idea is creeping into my mind. A masterstroke. I'm suddenly very intelligent. Probably comes from making love to that French girl last night. I'm subtle. I'm even profound. Oh, I'm so profound, it's making my head spin. <laughs> Are you listening to me, Thomas? I'm listening, my prince. We need a new Archbishop of Canterbury. I think there is a man we can rely on. No matter who it is, once the Archbishop's mitre is on his head, he will no longer be on your side. But if the Archbishop is my man, if Canterbury is for the king, how could his power possibly get in my way? But my lord, we know your bishops. Once enthroned at Canterbury, every one of them would grow dizzy with power. Not this man. This is someone who doesn't know what dizziness means. Someone who isn't afraid of God. I'm sorry to deprive you of the French girls and the other spoils of victory. But are you listening to me, Thomas? Hmm? You're leaving for England tonight. On what mission, my prince? You are going to deliver a letter to all the bishops of England. Mm -hmm. My royal edict nominating you, Thomas Beckett, primate of England, Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Shut up. Thomas, I'm in deadly earnest. My lord. Don't do this. You have an odd way of taking good news. I should think it would be triumphant. But I... I'm not even a priest. You're a deacon. You can be ordained priest and consecrated archbishop the next day. Have you considered what the Pope would say? I'll pay his price. My lord. This frightens me. I thought you had God in the palm of your hand, Thomas. I beg of you, do not do this. You've never disappointed me, Thomas. And you're the only man I can trust. 
You leave for England tonight. Beckett. Thank you for returning to us the keys of our city. The die is cast, Thomas. Make the most of it. And if I know you, I'm sure you will. This is based, of course, on a, a true incident okay, that occurred uh, in, in England uh, during the 11th century. And, uh, but compared to what we're talking about, we're going to talk about in a minute, this is a Methodist ice cream social compared to what was prepared to take the, uh, the uh, Pope of Rome and to take over that. I want to introduce you to a couple of the, the people that are going to be involved in this. Justinian. Justinian is the emperor of New Rome, and he's a dynamic, very intelligent person, a rather serious Catholic, not a bad lay theologian, takes it you know, rather seriously. His goal is to restore Rome to its ancient glory, to take back North Africa, take back Italy, take back Spain if he can, you know, make the Mediterranean once again a Roman lake, and to do it in a, in a, in a unified fashion. He's got this vision. He's a wonderful administrator. You know, he's a fairly good judge of people. Uh, he, uh, he gets good generals around him to lead, especially one named General Belisarius, okay, who's a, 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 an excellent uh, uh, strategic genius, who's also a very brave fighter. And he, uh, he's going to do this. He's going to bring Rome back to the way it, it was. Now, there's a lot of problems, though, in doing that. And there's, especially, there's problems of the disunity in the Eastern Roman Empire itself. The biggest one is this monophysite heresy. Okay, what does that mean? Big tongue twister of a word, an alphabet soup. Okay, it is one nature. Okay, uh, it's a reaction to what's called the low Christology of Nestorianism. Okay, there was an, the patriarch of Constantinople, a guy named Nestorius, who was trained in the very humanistic school of Antioch, uh, emphasizing the humanity of Christ. And so the story, I'm simplifying this a bit, okay, but basically taught that there were two distinct persons in Christ, okay? There's Jesus the man and God the son who acted together, but they're two completely distinct persons. And so uh, the idea, his, his watchword was, he, we shouldn't be calling Mary the mother of God, okay? We should be calling her the mother of Christ because, of course, she didn't create God, so we're calling her Christ. Now, this was a startling thing to your ordinary Catholic believer. Okay, wait a minute. We've always been calling Mary the mother of God. What are you talking about? What do, what do you mean you can't call her? Jesus is God, isn't he? Well, he is, but this is his humanity. She's the mother of his humanity. Yeah, but that humanity is united to the person of God, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Okay, and so you, uh, uh, now this was defeated, okay, at a, a, an ecumenical council, okay, Nestorius was declared to be a heretic. Uh, he was uh, excommunicated, and, uh, uh, but what a lot of people in the, especially beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire in Persia, went with him. Okay, they said, wait a minute, no, we like this kind of lower Christology, this idea that Christ didn't know that he was God, you know, stuff like that, okay. Uh, they, the emphasis on the humanity of Christ is so strong that it's really uh, it's looked at as God just working through this man, Jesus. God using this man, Jesus, rather than Jesus being both God and man. Now, in the, Egypt, in the Egyptians didn't like this at all. Uh, they were led by a very dynamic, what we call Archbishop, the Patriarch of Alexandria. Also, he's also even known as the Pope of Alexandria, not competing with the Pope of Rome, but he was in charge of, he's the primate of, of Egypt, Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria, who emphasizes very much both Mary's role, okay, as being truly the mother of, of God, the mother of Jesus who is God, and the divinity of Jesus Christ. That it really, you know, it, it, Jesus is indeed God incarnate, 
And uh, they hated this Nestorian stuff. In fact, uh, the Council of Ephesus, which condemned Nestorianism, was chaired by Cyril of Alexandria as the direct delegate of the Pope of Rome. Now, uh, Egypt reacted so strongly to the Nestorians that they uh, refused to go along with the Council of 451 AD, the Council of Chalcedon, which defined the fact that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. One person, but with two natures. Two natures united in one person, both independent, both truly human, fully human, with a human intellect and everything else, and learning things as a, as a human being, but also united in a single person, truly God. Uh, this is such a problem, okay, that Egypt is close to rebellion. And Syria is divided three ways, okay, over this issue. Three, and, and again, people took religion seriously. Riots break out in Syria. Riots break out in Egypt. Riots break out all over the place, fighting among you know, these various conceptions of what is the true nature of, of Jesus Christ. The creed of, of Chalcedon, okay, in 451, was formulated especially by the intervention of a very great and famous pope, Pope Leo I, this famous guy that faced uh, Adela the Hun down, you know, when he was at the gates of Rome and convinced him not to sack Rome, okay? Uh, he also intervened in this, uh, uh, this uh, ecumenical council. He sent a long, uh, I guess what we'd call a, a treatise to the council. It's called the Tome, T-O-M-E of Leo, where he says very, very clearly what is good Catholic doctrine? Jesus basically simplified, Jesus Christ is true God and true man, but he, he spelled it out. It's not just a one sentence thing. He goes on for all, several pages kind of explaining what we mean by that. And it was, it's really a, a quite interesting and dramatic uh, work of theology. So much so when the doctrine was read at the Council of Chalcedon, the bishops there said, Peter has spoken through Leo. Okay, and that becomes the, um, the doctrine of the church, both East and West. However, armed and dangerous opposition. Egypt breaks away from the church because of this. They said, no, no, we don't like this. It looks like you're giving up the store back to the Nestorians. You're, when you're talking about Jesus being a man, you're denying effectively his divinity. Uh, you know, when you, no, Jesus is one person, one nature, and it's God. And they said, no, I mean, that, that Leo said it right. He goes, well, we don't agree with Leo because I, we, we like the way Cyril uh, did it. Okay, now, this introduces us to, us to one of the most famous women in history, Theodora, the love of life of the Emperor Justinian. You can kind of see her right here. She's famously a very, very beautiful woman with an extremely interesting history. Theodora. She started out as the daughter of a bear trainer, okay? So in the, literally, in the, which was called The Circus, okay, in Constantinople, which was a variety show where people would be entertained, uh, her dad was one of the entertainers, kind of almost what you'd call almost a vaudeville act. But she's remarkably beautiful, and she uses this as a springboard to get to be known pretty much in the public. She's an entertainer, she's an actress, she's in the theater. She's very, very well known, and her beauty is... Uh, legendary. She decides she's got what it takes and she knows how to use it. She's going to use that beauty to get herself in a good position. So she starts romancing uh, people who are prominent in the government, the governor of Africa. You know, become, she becomes his girlfriend. Uh, she manipulates her position in various ways to always uh, you know, come into a very favorable position for her. Her morals are not very good at all, okay, but she, uh, she's got a lot of assets and she, she uses them uh, to her distinct advantage. She, however, okay, gets religion, okay. She, during her travels, uh, at one point she bottoms out and she goes to confession. She talks to a priest. The priest is a monophysite priest. He's a priest from Egypt. And he uh, brings her to a whole new awareness of God and to say, I'm going to leave my life behind. 
And she becomes, it's, 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 you see this like a lot of people, where they find religion, they're very loyal to the, the person or church where they found religion. It could be the Jehovah Witnesses, okay, but if this is where they found their sense of meaning, now they're going to be Jehovah Witnesses for the rest of their lives, even if their last name is McNamara, okay? So, but th and so this is what happens to uh, uh, Theodora. She becomes a dedicated monophysite convert, and she falls in love with Justinian. And he's crazy about her. And uh, when riots break out, actually, uh, over a sporting event, okay, in, in 50, 532, uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, the big, the gladiator shows had been thrown out, okay? And what's the passion of sports at the time is the chariot races. And the chariot races have teams and different, the teams appeal to different factions. There's the green team and the blue team, and uh, they, they also have some political overtones to them, kind of like in Scotland. The, in Glasgow, the Celtics, okay, are kind of the Catholic team, okay, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, there's, there's another team, I forget what they are uh, uh, in Glasgow, but they're the Protestant team. There's fight, a little bit like the Cubs and the White Sox here in the United States, in Chicago, but uh, this becomes, it, 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 it takes a level where serious riots break out over the chariot races. Uh, they're mad about taxes. Both sides turn on the emperor and uh, pull off, there's anarchy going on in the streets for a while. Justinian doesn't know what to do. Theodora kind of slaps him around a little bit and says, hey, if you're going to leave, you know, you can kiss everything goodbye. You know, your ideas of grandeur, they're all going to be gone. Man up, fight this, and you'll come out on top. And he, she basically uh, inspired him, and he did. He, he conquered the thing, and she then became associated with him in the rule. He really liked what she had to say. He had a great deal. He not only was passionate about her, he had a great deal of respect for the the uh, uh, the power of her will, the head that she had on her shoulders, and her a bad guy, okay, who is also becomes, he's a guy who would like to be the Pope, okay. A man named Vigilius, he's a Roman. He comes from a very good uh, Roman family. His, his, uh, his family were historic uh, Roman patricians. Uh, his, his father was uh, head of the uh, uh, Praetorian Guard that still existed, okay, in, in Rome at the time. Uh, Roman senator, very well connected. And like a lot of people, uh, think, hey, you know what, let me get into the religion racket, okay, because I might be able to be a big shot without a lot of heavy lifting, okay. And so he uh, has his eyes set on becoming Pope of Rome. Now, Given the political turmoil that's going around in, in Italy at, at the time, where the, the Goths are ruling Rome, but the people are still at heart Romans, okay, speaking Latin, they don't really like the Goths, but, you know, uh, the guys that are running it, the gangs that are running it are all these Ostrogoths, there's jockeying for position and people looking out for themselves and kind of uh, rich people then making alliances with the Goths one moment and maybe with looking over toward Constantinople another moment, but really looking out for themselves. And, you know, the, since the, uh, the, the position that is the highest position of respect in the city of Rome itself is the papacy, that's the thing you want to capture. And uh, uh, there, when a pope dies, there's all kinds of conflict that arises over after the death of a pope. Again, the different factions are trying to put their favorite sons on the throne of Peter. And so in the midst of this, one of the guys who's pope, okay, at the time says, you know what, let's stop this idea of a papal election. Let's go back to the way it was in the beginning. Obviously, nobody, there, nobody elected Linus. Peter appointed him. Let's go back to that. I'm changing the rules, says, uh, says the pope. I'm going to make, I'm going to tell you ahead of time who my successor is going to be. I'm, I'm, I'm the pope, so I can, I can change the, the mode of papal election. And I'm saying right now, we're going to have... Vigilius be the next pope. He comes from a good family. Uh, he's, uh, you know, their ancient Roman stock. Uh, he's a sharp guy, and uh, I, I appoint him, okay? And it creates a, a controversy, because they said, wait a minute, you know, this is unheard of for hundreds of years since the time of, you know, the very first popes. No one's ever done this. We don't like it. Uh, and it creates such a reaction that the pope decides to say, all right, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. Uh, We'll go back to the way it was uh, bef uh, done before. At this time, it was, it was the priests of Rome 
that would elect the, elect the pope at the death of a pope. So Virgilius, sorry, pal, you're going to have to go through elections just like anybody else. Okay, he's mad about that. Okay, but he bides his time. He's a Roman deacon, and the deacons have a lot of administrative power in the church. And he's thinking a lot about, boy, I, I almost had it in my hands. I almost had it. I want to get it back. Vigilius, he's rich. He comes from a, 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 quite a bit of money. Well-connected. <coughs> Roman deacon. He had been the heir apparent. Very, very political. Uh, he, uh, he's, uh, he's been compared in the history books in modern terms, to a successful lobbyist. You know, the guy with a big cigar that knows how to manipulate people, knows how to butter them up, uh, knows how to uh, end up you know, with himself being in charge of you know, the Willet Creek Dam, okay, or, or you know, like Mr. Smith goes to Washington, making the most out of it. He's extremely ambitious. He wants to be the Pope. Now, oh, and he, in the fact, it's one way to always go up is to do a good job where you are. Okay, so he's very, uh, you know, um, he knows how to grease the skids. He knows how to uh, 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 butter up the, not only the nice families, but the ecclesiastics. And he gets himself kind of appointed to be what we would, the apocrisarius, which is kind of the ambassador He's, get, he's what today we call the Secretary of State for the Pope, okay? He's made uh, the guy who is supposed to go with the Pope to uh, speak to uh, the Emperor in Constantinople. Now, in Constantinople, he runs into Theodora. And Theodora tells, uh, I'm gonna go back. Theodora tells uh, Vigilius, hey, I hear you want to be Pope. I can make you Pope. I'm the Lady Augusta. I mean, I'm, I'm the uh, Empress Reignant, okay? I can manipulate the, there's a lot, I've got a lot of friends all over the place. They certainly have friends in Rome. Uh, I, can, I can be a Pope, I can make you Pope, uh, but uh, you know, uh, we got a little problem here, okay? And the problem is that the last two Popes don't like the, the good, quote unquote, monophysite bishops that I like. I had a great guy that I wanted to make Archbishop of Constantinople, and your Pope, you know, the, your predecessor here, uh, you know, vetoed that. He said the guy's a heretic. I don't believe that. He's not a heretic. I mean, he, he's just, a, he knows that Jesus is truly God, okay? And th this is who I want to see. I want to see these people who made me what I am be in charge of the church. And don't worry about the councils of Chalcedon and stuff like that. We'll reverse that. If you're Pope, you can do anything. Uh, and so uh, the pope, the, the, the reigning pope that he's the ambassador of, dies. So now here's the opportunity. Okay, the empress is going to say, I'm going to send you back to Rome with letters from me. We're going to talk to the people, and you're going to be pope, except something happens. In Rome, they elect a different guy, <laughs> okay, before he gets back, okay? They elect a guy named Silverius, wonderful man, okay? Actually, Silverius's father had been a holy pope, okay, a Saint Hormizdus, okay. Hormizdus had been married before he undertook holy orders, and uh, Silverius was one of his children. It was a devout family. Uh, so, uh, Hormizdus had actually resolved a schism that had occurred between Constantinople and Rome when he was pope, and Silverius, uh, is, the, the Gothic king, says, you know, I, we, want, we don't want... I'm a little bit nervous when I see these guys going over, these bishops and deacons going over to Constantinople. I think they're plotting to, to take Italy back, okay? Uh, and so I, I don't want to wait for anything. I, I think we should have an election right now. And uh, he, he throws his weight behind Silverius, and Silverius is elected pope. And he's a wonderful man. So all of a sudden, now we got a, a monkey wrench in the machine, okay? What are we going to do? So uh, 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 Theodora meets secretly with Vigilius, so they can connive together for a little deal. Uh, Vigilius says, hey, this is going to cost us you know, a little money. I can't just do this, uh, you know, with a wave of the hand. Uh, I'm going to need some help. Uh, if there's going to be a, a real election, I'm going to probably have to make it worth people's while to vote for me as pope. So she gives him 700 pounds of gold, the equivalent of over 10 million bucks in today's money, okay, to... Go pass that around. 
and keep some for yourself. And, you know, she says, I also know that we are planning to take Italy back. You'll have an army behind you, and you'll have our best general, who really knows how to fight, and he, he, you know, he's as loyal to my husband as can be. He'll make sure that you don't have any trouble. And uh, then, but th this is what I'll do for you. Now, for me, you got to bring these two guys, Anthemus and Severus, the guy that, what, that I wanted to be Patriarch of Constantinople and the guy that I wanted to be Patriarch of Antioch. We'll put those guys in. You declare that they're not heretics, that they're right. And now we'll have all the big power centers of the church in the hands of people who are right thinking. And I want you to bomb out that Chalcedon Council. You know, that Tome of Leo that's got to go, you know, uh, that's very disrespectful to Christ our Lord and the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, as I see it. And, uh, you know, we, we got to change that. i got to change the magisterium of the church. All right, so what does he do? Okay, so uh, Belisarius comes and he starts invading in Sicily. The people are very happy that Romans are coming back. Roman armies are coming back. They open the doors of, of, of practically all the cities of Sicily to them. He marches triumphantly through Calabria. He takes Naples. He heads to Rome and with that, not too much opposition. And uh, now they say, well, what are we going to do about Silverius? Well, let's accuse him of something, okay? What, you know, if we, can, if we can muck him up, even though he's always been a good guy, if we can pin, pin uh, a, a heavy rap on him, then if, he's, if people think he's a traitor and he's no good, the worst thing we can think of is he's a traitor, he wants to sell out Rome to the Goths again, then maybe we'll get rid of him and let him prove that he's not a traitor. So he's arrested. So what, what uh, they do, but they, they, they do it kind of subtly. Vigilius is in his entourage. Okay, so uh, he, they said, uh, Vigilius, we want you to bring, you know, uh, uh, the, the Pope, Pope Silverius, over to meet with uh, uh, Belisarius uh, to talk about it. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, when uh, the Roman army, the Eastern Roman army, came marching back into Rome, oh, Silverius, you know, being a Roman, was happy to see them. It was very nice to him. He was a kindly guy. He welcomed him back to Rome. Belisarius thought he was Belisarius a good guy. You know, he was a loyal general, good Catholic. He said, yeah, this guy, Silverius, is a wonderful guy. I, I don't have anything against him. But on the other hand, Belisarius is married to somebody named Antonina. Okay? And Antonina's best friend is Theodora. Who, you know, she's kind of a groupie, you know, she's kind of part of a mean girls, okay? She's in the, uh, uh, she's going to take all her cues from Theodora, whatever Lola wants or Theodora wants, Theodora's going to get, and Antonina is going to make sure that she gets to remain in the in crowd in Constantinople. So, uh, and uh, kind of the way Justinian is nuts about Theodora, uh, Belisarius is nuts about Antonina too, okay? And so they, they call Silverius in for a nice little meeting, it turns out, he, he thinks he's going to a meeting led by his right-hand man, Vigilius, and it turns out that uh, the meeting is, takes place in uh, the bedroom of Antonina. Okay, she's just sitting there like a queen on, on, on a couch, and she said, you're a traitor. Take that, those papal robes off. You're, I, I know what you're trying to do. I mean, you're trying to hand this city, you know, this sacred city of Rome, back to the barbarians. You don't deserve to be pope. You were plotting with the Ostrogoths from the beginning. Uh, you know, you're out. And so they, they ripped the clothes right off his back. They ripped the vestments off his back. They dressed him in a monk's robe, and, uh, uh, and he's taken away. And uh, they announce, because of his crimes... He's, you know, serious crimes, you know, serious sins, you know, against the commonweal. He's deposed as pope. And guess who's going to be pope? Oh, and they, and, 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 they, uh, and they, they, they exile him. They said, you know, uh, for your crimes, and you're going to get out of Italy. You know, we're going to take you to, you know, someplace, you know, far away where no, you can't arouse uh, sympathy or opposition. We're going to take you here to the coast of Asia Minor, you know, where you're going to be uh, just, uh, you know, cooling your heels for uh, uh, forever, okay? And of course, we now have uh, oh, uh, somebody out, we're, we're putting Virgilius in as Pope, okay? Uh, and we're gonna call election, <laughs> since you're deposed, and uh, you know, everybody's sitting there, they got the, the Byzantine army at their back, and they said, okay, I guess Virgilius is home. And, uh, but meanwhile, 
Uh, Silverius was a fine guy. He just wanted to be a good priest, you know, a good bishop all his life. When he gets down to Patara, Patara is a Christian town. The local bishop sees him. He says, this is a, this is a railroad job. He's falsely accused. There's nothing wrong with Silverius. He doesn't even know the gospel. He doesn't speak their language. <coughs> this is a complete fraud. The local bishop appeals to Justinian. He said, I don't know how this guy got exiled, but this is completely wrong. These are false accusations that have been made. He doesn't even have the opportunity to defend himself. I mean, this, this is uh, completely wrong. And Justinian is a Catholic. He said, okay, you know what? We're going to have him, we're going to actually have an investigation of this. And if he's vindicated, you know, we're going to send him back to Rome. But if he's not, okay, that's a different story. We'll cross that when the time comes. And so he's supposed to go back to Rome. But Vigilius orders that the ship taking him back to Rome doesn't come to Rome. Send him off to an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and let him stay there. And uh, be after a few months, Silverius dies. Okay. Now, how exactly he died? We don't know. He, did he, was it convenient that he died? Yeah, it was extremely convenient. Because now there goes the real pope, and the only man standing is Vigilius. Some people say that they starved him to death. Some say that they poisoned him. Some say he just died because of all the stress and everything else, but he dies. So now Vigilius becomes the undisputed pope. The priests get together and say, well, I guess, you know, we don't have any choice. I guess Vigilius is pope. So now... Uh, uh, and at first, okay, the, the first year when he's kind of an anti-pope, you know, where the real pope is being abused and, and, and exiled and everything else, Vigilius is talking Theodora's game. He's talking how great these bishops are that she wanted to appoint. And, uh, uh, the, you know, we have to look into this a little further. We ought to make sure that, you know, justice is done to these innocent bishops. But once he becomes the real pope in 538, all of a sudden, things start to be different. Uh, He's not restoring these two bishops. And Theodora wants to know why. Hey, I paid 10 million smackers, okay, buddy? Deliver! It's now, I gave it my part of the deal. How about yours? And she says, I want a response and I want it now. And she gets this interesting response. Far be this, this, this these are the actual words of now Pope Vigilius. Far be this for me, Lady Augusta. Formerly, I spoke wrongly and foolishly, but now I certainly refuse to restore a man who is a heretic and under anathema. Though unworthy, I am vicar of Blessed Peter the Apostle, as were my predecessors, the most holy Agapetus and Silverius, who condemned him. He changes horses. He goes to a completely different way. And that's not the only change that he has. First, he sends this letter to Theodora saying, no, no, I'm going along with the Council of Chelsea and the whole bet. And then he reaffirms specifically the Tome of Leo and specifically the Council. He says, no, no, we have to be faithful to what the Magisterium defined, whether you like it or not. And to make matters worse, okay, the Goths do counterattack. They besiege Rome. And, uh, and so now, you know, we, we, we got a whole situation that it's completely different. And uh, uh, Justinian you know, uh, is trying to find a way out of this. Okay. He wanted to say, now, how can we make the Egyptians and the Monophysite Syrians happy? I got a way I think we can do it. You know, I think uh, there's a way out of this. There were three theologians, I'm simplifying this a bit, okay, who kind of inspired this guy Nestorius in his low Christology. Okay, their names are similar. One's called Theodore of Mopsuestia. There's a tongue twister for you. Another one is Theodoret uh, of, of Cyrus. Okay, and the other one is Ebas of Edessa. Okay, now they wrote a number of, they were part of the school of Antioch, and they wrote a number of essays, a number of treatises, very much emphasizing the humanity of Christ, even to a kind of a, uh, to a heretical degree. Okay, now, if we show 
the Egyptians and the Syrians that we really are full believers in the divinity of Christ. If we condemn these guys, and these guys have been dead for 100 years, they died in the peace of the church, but if we get the church to condemn their writings and condemn them, then maybe the Egyptians will see this is really more a matter of terminology than anything else. We're with them on the divinity of Christ. I mean, we're not going to dispute that. And so uh, let's get these three chapters, they're called, these three theologians, these dead theologians condemned, and maybe the Egyptians and the Syrians will be happy. Maybe even my wife will be happy. Oops. Okay. All right. Well, Vigilius now, he's turned around. So he's, he doesn't even want to get anything too close to any of this. He, he knows, because he plotted with them, okay, that these guys are capable of all kinds of Byzantine uh, um, plots. So he, doesn't, he just wants to stay away from them. He doesn't even want, even, he doesn't even want to look at uh, Justinian's condemnation because he's afraid that, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> he's going to go the other way too far, and he's going to get the rest of the church mad at him for not backing the magisterial teaching of the church. And so Justinian says, okay, we got to give, we got to drag Vigilius here too. We got to talk sense to him in Constantinople. He's arrested by Justinian, and Vigilius says, well, you know, now he's talking like a good guy. He says, do with me what you wish. This is the just punishment for what I've done. If you got to take me, take me. Uh, so uh, for the next 10 years, he's yanked out of Rome. He's kept a prisoner in Constantinople. They're trying to browbeat him. They're trying to get him, and it goes back and forth. The Pope and the Emperor are having all kinds of plots and counterplots. Uh, you know, he, uh, the Emperor is trying to enforce the Pope to go along with uh, the way he wants to do it. And the Emperor isn't wrong theologically about this stuff, but, but Vigilius is, is scared. He doesn't know what to do, so he keeps going back and forth. Ultimately, in 553, uh, Justinian calls an ecumenical council. He calls a council for all the bishops from, uh, you know, around the world to come. And they look at the, uh, uh, these three theologians, the so-called three chapters, and they said, yeah, this stuff is too, this, does, that, this is too much a separation of persons in Christ. There are errors in this, even though these guys did die, they, 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 they had all accepted the Council of Chalcedon. But their terminology is dangerous, and so they, we are going to judge them as heretics now uh, because they, uh, even though they conformed ultimately to the decision of the church, their teachings are still confusing and they're still suspect, and so they should be condemned. And ultimately, Pope Vigilius agrees with the condemnation, okay, and is allowed to return to Rome. Now, his... Right hand during his trip back to Rome, he dies. Okay, he never makes it back to Rome. He dies in Sicily, okay, not too far from Rome, but still got a ways to go. <coughs> and uh, his right hand man is a guy named Pelagius. Pelagius was extremely suspicious of anything to do, anything coming out of uh, Constantinople. Uh, he was trying to fortify Vigilius and standing up to Justinian, but ultimately. He also uh, uh, goes along with the condemnation of the three chapters. And this creates a reaction because the people in Africa and northern Italy and Milan and uh, you know, Aquileia say, you know, if, if they're changing their mind now, they're changing the magisterium, so uh, uh, we're breaking away. You know, we're, we, we, you know, the, obviously the papacy has shown itself to be vacillating, so we don't need to go along with it. We're just going to go our own route. And so... Milan, Africa, and uh, 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 the area which is now, like, say, where Venice is now, break away. It creates a schism. One of the, you know, Vigilius ends up you know, dying. Pelagius becomes pope. He reaffirms the Orthodox Catholic teaching as codified even in, in, in the Council of Constantinople. And all over time, you know, the church gets back to where it's supposed to be. Well, what are the lessons that we learn from this? One, the holder of Peter's keys can be flawed, unworthy, and ill-advised and sinful. Vigilius was all of that. 
Peter is not guaranteed infallibility in either prudential, provisional, or personal judgments or conduct. So, I mean, an obvious ridiculous example, Peter, if uh, the Pope says, I think, uh, uh, the Cubs are going to win the World Series. They're going to make it to the World Series. They're going to win. I mean, his guess is as good as anybody else's. Okay, obviously, we all know that. Okay. But uh, on the other hand, too, I mean, uh, it, who a pope chose, chooses as Cardinal of Boston, okay, if he, has to, if he ultimately has to choose one, is not necessarily guaranteed by any infallibility whatsoever, or the arguments that a pope wants to use to articulate, uh, you know, uh, his own personal ideas that are uh, doctrinal are just as good as those ideas are. And then number two, an unworthy pope can create, will create, serious and long-lasting damage. Vigilius created a lot of damage, okay? Uh, you know, it took, it took over a hundred years for the church in Northern Italy to become, come back to union with uh, the rest of the Catholic Church. It took Africa a number of years. Africa came back first, but it took them a while, and they were separated for a while, and it took Milan a while. Uh, there's serious problems that happen when a pope is unworthy. They, cre they create a lot of damage. But ultimately, the magisterium will be reaffirmed, perhaps by unexpected sources, which later seem to be providential. Of all people, you know, theologically, Justinian was right, okay? I mean, in and, and this whole process, as painstaking, as painful as it was, ended up being providential because the exact, the, 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 a clearer vision doctrinally was ratified by the church as to exactly who Jesus Christ is. The Holy Spirit will steer the ship eventually into a safe court, even when the captain is inadequate. The gates of hell do not prevail, and the church's mission is never extinguished. And that's shown especially by the next slide. There's a resurrection that occurs in a very interesting and strange way. While this is all going on, while there's all this conniving and backstabbing and betrayal and plotting and people jockeying with different political factions going on in Rome and people looking out for themselves and trying to make the best life that they can for themselves, a young man named Benedict decides, you know what, I'm going to get out of this whole thing. I just want to follow Christ through giving him everything that I can. And so he ends up, okay, in a mountaintop, okay, uh, between Rome and Naples. Uh, I'm simplifying this, obviously, but the mountaintop is the, his f final permanent monastery is Monte Cassino. And there he attracts a lot of people by the virtue of his life, by the, the sublimity of his ideal, by the common sense that he had, by the wisdom that he exemplified in his personal life to say, you know what, we're with you. You know, the most important thing is God. Uh, let's put everything at God's disposal. Let's pray and work and work and pray. And, and you know, uh, and seek God above all things and we'll see what happens. These, St. Benedict is, is not as popular as a saint today, particularly in our country, as he was in the Middle Ages. St. Benedict then, in the Middle Ages, almost was like St. Francis is, is, is to us now. I mean, he's a very, very popular saint. And be, he's popular because he got a lot of people to give themselves directly to God, and they bore a lot of fruit. The monastery of Monte Cassino began to be a paradigm monastery, a quintessential monastery that was a combination of both total dedication to God and common sense. I mean, he, unlike, you know, he, he didn't want the monks to be doing outlandish penances, staying up all night, you know, uh, uh, scourging themselves. You know, no, no, he goes, hey, let's do things in moderation. Let's put things, you know, in God's hands, but let's seek God above all things and let's live to fight another day. And the Benedictine experience, which people saw, began to be inspiring in a world that was falling apart. Benedictines even came to Rome, okay? And in Rome, daughter, a daughter monastery of Monte Cassino was founded. It was, it was, it was founded, uh, I think, on the Aventine Hill, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, it's the Church of St. Saint, Saint Gregory, okay? And uh, they uh, uh, it tremendously inspired the people because all of a sudden, hey, this is the real McCoy. This is not a guy like Vigilius just trying to be a big shot. 
these are guys that are working all day and praying all day and giving it all they've got. Hey, uh, they're good people, and they're giving us education and stuff for free. They become so well-known that the young, dynamic, prefect of Rome enters, take, undertakes a Benedictine vocation himself. He says, you know, I'm going to resign from my political office. I'm a big shot in Rome. I'm in charge of the government. But you know what? I don't care about any of that. I want to see God. I want to, I want to be close to God. I want to do what these Benedictines are doing. He joins as a humble monk in the Benedictine monastery and ends up becoming Pope Gregory the Great. Okay? And Pope Gregory the Great was elected to the chair of Peter 590 uh, uh, AD, okay, less than 40 years after the events that we're talking about here, after the, after the death of Agilius. And because of the inspiration that he had from people who were giving it all they had, giving it, not just talking about it, but actually putting their lives and their souls behind it, Gregory becomes the, the, the most influential person in all of Christendom at the time, okay? He becomes one of the real, truly greatest popes who becomes the inspiration for the popes for the next thousand years, okay? Because he wants to take this Benedictine ideal of giving everything we have to God, seeking God above all things, living it, making sure that it, with, with checks and balances, okay, and applying that to the church, and he becomes really the father of the Middle Ages with everything that the Middle Ages predicted. Uh, and forth, Shark Cathedral, in a certain sense, is part of the progeny of people who reacted to, in the right way, the deficiencies of others who were doing it the wrong way. Getting back to basics, getting ourselves ready to be apostles, first of all, to be dialoguing with God, to be giving everything we have to God, and then be leading others to God, to be able to form others. And so this is, I think, the challenge. We can get sometimes such a view that's what's going on in the top, okay, is so important, and it is important. Like I said, it creates serious damage when the top is where it should be. But nevertheless, we have to respond to God, and if we do, if we take what one writer has called the Benedictine option, I don't agree with him on, on, he, to the extent he wants to create new communities and stuff like that. I don't agree with that. But I do agree with the Benedictine option to the extent that we need to be the ones that look for the opportunities to truly live the Catholic faith, to tell people what it really means, to live it loyally, heroically, inspiring others to do it, so that this light of the world that is Christ shines first in our own hearts, we spread that light to others, and we light up the world as a result. And over time, because it is the light of Christ, not our own light, it will light up the world, and it will bear fruit, because we're now abiding in Christ, and that fruit will last. I think that's the resurrection that was the most unlikely thing to happen. But it started with not people manipulating a political game, okay, trying to jockey whether the Ostrogothic king or, or the Byzantine emperor should be the big enchilada in Rome, but trying to say, is Christ the real Christ, the Christ that's been revealed, the Christ that's taught to us by the magisterium, is he going to be our king, the king of our lives, that we're the one that we're going to follow? And if he is, we also will experience a resurrection. Okay. All right, good. Hopefully, see you next week. Bring your friends. Thank you.